Ladies and gentlemen, I'm much pleased tonight to introduce Mr. Peter Bartholomew, the past president of the Royal Asian Society of Korea branch, also a dear friend of mine who came to Korea in 1968 for the first time. 68? When he was only five years old. <laughs> Say that. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say five years old? Forty-five years old. Yeah, no, 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 no. Ah, why? <laughs> After graduating from Hamilton College in upstate New York, he joined Peace Corps and came to Korea in '68 and lived in Gangneung. Lived with the Korean family in Gangneung, uh, who are one of the prominent uh, families of Korea who lived in Gyeong, uh, Sun Gyojang. Uh, I think he will explain more later. Uh, for five years. Anyway, he stayed on and became an expert things on Korea, studying with the Korean architecture, uh, Korean culture and history, etc. He fr frequently appears in TV. Even he met, uh, he welcomed uh, President Park uh, on our inauguration day in Hwang Hong uh, and he is known as one of the most famous social activists advocating uh, preservation of a Korean traditional architecture uh, and he has been living in a Korean true Korean Hangul <coughs> for the past 30 years, for over 30 years constantly fighting against the uh, city developer who wants to demolish all these old buildings and build apartment buildings. Uh, tonight's presentation will center around uh, of his major interest in preserving uh, Korean traditional architecture. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Peter with a big round of applause. Can you hear me? No. Didn't think so. <laughs> Hello, is that better? Yes, yeah, a lot better. Okay, good. <coughs> As Mr. Zhang said, I've been in Korea actually for over 30, uh, what is it, 45, 46 years. And I lived, Sung Yojang was the estate of a very, very high aristocratic family, direct descendants from Yi Tejo, Yi Song Ge, the founder of the Chosen Dynasty. So they were royal family. Their estate in Gangneung is, people call it a Yangban aristocratic estate. It's more than that. It's actually what you would call a kind of detached palace. It's uh, semi-palatial in its size. When I moved in there, I had a clue. It was just gorgeous and beautiful, but run down. Um, I lived there five years and studied and uh, continue to do that today. Korea's position between China and Japan has and her isolation in the early years, followed by the occupation by Japanese, the upheavals of the war, division of the country, etc., etc., and the very late development of Asian Studies section on Korea, have led this country's art and history, culture, and especially architecture to be ignored, unknown, not so much overshadowed, but just simply not studied. There's it is nowhere more true than in respect of architecture. <coughs> Korea's significant architectural history goes back probably roughly 2,000 years. I'm talking significant. Depends on how you count it. Korean architecture is the fountainhead of Japanese monumental architecture. Of course there was influence directly from China, but enormous influence, I think, from Korea. <coughs> There is borrowing from China, of course, but really it's the fundamentals of the engineering, the weight load bearing, load weight transfer, and the rest. The rest in terms of layout, design, and indeed developments in engineering scientifically are, of course, adapted for the Korean climate and the character, nature, and requirements of the people. And therefore, it's developed over the past 2,000 years a highly sophisticated, multi-layered design and execution style. 
this subject is not dealt with by Korean studies scholars either in Korea or outside of Korea in universities in Europe, America, Canada, and the rest. Why is this? Because only the scantiest evidence remains of it today. The extent to which Korea has lost its heritage, significant monumental architecture, and the residential vernacular Hano is unsurpassed in terms of loss and catastrophe in Asia. Just for example, in 1910, at the start of the Japanese occupation, the vast body of architecture included roughly, I'm talking monumental architecture, major structures, 17,000 to 20,000 buildings, over 400 compounds. Palaces in the Seoul area, about 97% were demolished from 1910 to 1945. Not war, nothing natural, just purposeful demolition. There were 350 plus provincial walled towns, villages, and cities, inside of which were the provincial administrative centers that you would call Docheong, Shicheong, Guncheong in Korea today. 99.9% were demolished during that same period. There were roughly 100, 120, we don't know exactly, military compounds which we call fortresses, Sansong, which had in them anywhere from 20 to 60 buildings, similar to the provincial uh, province buildings, which were 40 to 80 buildings. And in that case, truly 99.999 infinitely were demolished. The only thing that the Japanese, only section that the Japanese did not purposely destroy were the Buddhist temple monasteries and most of the Confucian academies, although they mangled seriously the Confucian academies. The main purpose of this lecture, first and foremost, whoops, here we go. Sorry about this, it's a little messy. First, you can't really appreciate what's missing until you know what was here. So the majority of this lecture will seek to inform you what was here and the you, number one, unique and sophisticated aspects. What is so specific and unique? We're talking about an extremely highly sophisticated um, aspect. I tried to do what I call a doomsday, as in England before the uh, 1066 invasion of the French. Royal palaces, provincial administrative centers, military compounds, Confucian school shrines, aristocratic estates, and the common vernacular Hanum. In the same the process, I'll describe what was destroyed in three major eras. First, 1910 to 45, Japanese occupation, primarily monumental structures. 1950 to 53, the Korean War, a massively destructive war, enormously destructive. Mm -hmm. 1960s until today, developments in the name, demolitions in the name of development and or for perceived profit. Some are government inspired, a great many simply the owner think he's going to make money by destroying this funny old building. <clears throat> and then finally, the, le the reasons for the post-Korean War, post-1953 Demolitions continuing today, lack of awareness of the values, of course, the values cultural and monetary, the government policies for national development, and generally people's mindset, prejudice against old buildings. Lastly but not leastly, projects to recover losses that have started to develop in the last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years, and the unfortunate misguided policies in that preservation, missing the points of the cultural values. Let's begin by looking at the scientific aspects of the Korean architecture. There, I divide this into scientific aspects in the design, the engineering, and all of that. Secondly, the aesthetics, the art, the high form of artists and craft, and how philosophy and literature are woven into the buildings. In the science, we've heard about Feng Shui in Chinese, Pung Su. And a lot of people say, oh, that's superstitious nonsense. And others think it's a great fad and they hire people and pay them a lot of money to know where to put their office chair to have more luck to make more money. But uh, 
The jury's out on that, you decide yourself. But more importantly, as a part of this initial study, was a practical land and soil survey been going on for 2,000 years, just like they do today. Indeed, the watershed, you don't want when a heavy rain comes, the water to flow down and wash your house away. Soil most moisture, viscosity, tight, grade, weight bearing capacity. Buildings that were built, walls that were built, not only a hundred but a thousand years ago, are still there and have not moved. So they did it right. They got their calculations right. Of course, we'll never know about the ones they got wrong because they're gone. Yeah. Wind directions and velocities in four seasons determines how you put the axis of the building and how you block wind from hitting the building inappropriately and sunlight angles. Just real quickly, <clears throat> if this is where the life force, the key, hits here, above it, the mountains on the left are called Tian Mujong, the turtle, Chu San, the turtle shaped ridge. On the, on the lower right, Chongyong, blue dragon shaped mountain, on the left is the white tiger. There must always be water flowing in front of the, of the structure or in front of a town. That's why we have the Han River flowing south of Seoul, not through the center of it. Sitting City was not built straddling the, uh, the rivers. I am not an artist, so <laughs> just understand I know it looks like some primary school kid wrote this, uh, drew this. I tried my bestest. Just to give you a brief idea, there is a specific type of, people call it dirt. It isn't dirt, it's, it's clay. Chin hook is a red, viscous clay that literally, if you mix it with water, you can make a pottery out of it. It's that, it's that stiff. So it, its viscosity, extreme denseness, is a fantastic insulator. As you well know, there's no better insulation material than a very dense clay. So it's put in the roof, above the rafters, under the roof tiles. The curve in the roof is created, by the way, by two different angles of rafters. The, the um, dense clay is put, and then the tiles above, so the sharp angle then is smoothed off to whatever the taste is of the owner. Coming down, the distance of which the rafters go out allows the rain to fall outside of the stone platform, a granite platform upon which the building is built. Certainly, you don't want rainwater to be hitting wooden beams in any case. So the design, the length of them, and indeed, to some extent, the angle of them producing the velocity of rainfall, the distance to which it will fall, is all scientifically organized. The walls are also the same a wattle of the dense clay. The, um, the floor, this is where you light the fire under the floor. The fire goes through flues, which I'll show you in a moment, which heats flat stones, on top of which there's more of this dense clay, and then it's covered with a very heavy paper, which is either oiled or lacquered. One most important aspect that's very different, for example, from the Japanese architecture, is the Korean buildings are built on a platform raised above the ground, a platform of granite. And this is to get the building up off the ground, away from the humidity of moisture in the ground, allow a greater flow of air around the building. The pillars are then put on a granite um, foundation that's anywhere from 30, 40, 50 centimeters high, depending upon its use. Moreover, at the bottom of the pillars, before the pillar is put onto the stone, the bottom of the wood is hollowed out in a little dome, packed with salt. Salt is then put also on the stone itself, and then it's set. And as the years go by, the salt, the salt leaches and soaks up because into the wood. And the effect then is to prevent rot and insects. Obviously, the most dangerous place for any wooden piece member is where it touches another material, i.e. the stone foundation or no piece of wood ever touches the ground, that's for sure. If you go to palaces, very old palaces, very old buildings with original wood, look at the bottom of the pillars sometime, and you'll see they're white. 
And if you take your finger and touch it, you'll see the white comes off of that salt from 100 to 300 years ago when the, when the structure was built. So it's a very scientific approach. And obviously, the other reason for raising it on the platform is to allow this ondal floor system of horizontal flues to, to exist. And a lot of people don't know in the more expensive old Hanok, under all of this was a bed of charcoal. The whole building was uh, charcoal bedded because charcoal is a tremendous humidity controller. So there's an awful lot of deep thought scientifically to protect this building to last for many hundreds of years by the uh, methodology that I just described. Here we have an example also where the rafter's length and angle is designed having looked at its position in respect to the sun. The building must always pay, face south, a little southwest, a little southeast, but nevertheless south. And the sun then coming in in the winter comes into the house as much as possible, and in the summertime, in the wintertime, hopefully it doesn't come in at all. Therefore, heat in the winter and cool in the summer. Another thing that is amazing and that I didn't learn until later, if you've seen traditional buildings in the front, sorry, in the front, the you have these latticework doors. Some are swinging, some are sliding. You couldn't possibly have wind and rain hitting those doors like they do on these western style buildings. It would ruin, destroy everything immediately. Wind and rain never, ever hit any of the walls where you have these doors. One big protection, of course, of the eaves that extend so far out. Other protection is the way the building is built. So they have to do a survey of the data of the area for seasons of the year, wind direction and velocity. And then the building is designed, I just gave you one example, this is designed as an L-shape, kyokcha, so the prevailing winds, this, act, this uh, wing here, <coughs> acts as a windbreak. So the wind rushes by and never hits any of these doors or the front of the house. <coughs> a number of years ago, I live in Ahano, and I was, there was a typhoon, and it was just offshore, Incheon. It was horrific. And outside, trees had fallen over. I could see signs and all sorts of things flying. It was just hell on wheels. And I sat right here with my feet on the terrace, sitting on the, the floor here. And I'm sorry, I smoked a cigarette. <coughs> Politically incorrect, I know. And the smoke, I mean, outside is this unbelievable maelstrom. And the smoke went just straight up, not affected at all by the wind. That's just amazing. But that level of scientific calculation for the sizing, position, axis, and elevation of the building is done for wind, rain, rain hitting, rain falling, every aspect to protect the building for a long lifetime. Just real quickly, to uh, give you an idea, this is the kitchen. The kitchen is usually at the end. If it's not, it's usually in the corner. <clears throat> Here, these little things are what you would call the fireplace or the firebox, where you light a wood fire, over which in the old days, of course, people cooked. Every time you lit the fire, the heat from the cooking fire goes under the floor and, and uh, simultaneously heats the room, which is a tremendous good use of energy, is it not? Of course, to be able to have the fire go under the floor, the floor of the kitchen must be considerably lower than the floor of this next room called the Anpang. This creates above the kitchen, because the ceiling then comes down that much, it creates a wonderful attic. I mean, everybody in this room has a complaint about wherever you live that you never have enough storage space. Tell me it's not true. We all have the same problem. But this, these attics, and I'll show you photographs of them later, are terrific. The Anpan was for the master and his wife. Just quickly to explain, the living style traditionally in Hanok, in Korean houses, each room was divided per person who performed all their functions there. They ate there, they slept there, they entertained there, they studied there. All their functions were in that room. 
in some houses, of course, people might eat together. The Maruban, so this is a heated floor room. The next one is not, only for the master and his wife. The next one is not heated floor room, and it had multiple purposes. In the countryside, it was often used by the women for, like, dry food preparation, flowers to make into duck, the rice cakes, and uh, to make bean paste, all kinds of things, and most importantly, to make makkali. Really, <laughs> quite critical. But in the hot summertime, you'd lay out a putati, a, a straw mat or a bamboo mat, and people would sit here and eat their meals and such. But it was an unheated room and thus not used in the winter. The next room would be for the son or daughter, called the konopang, and again, is an ondol uh, heated floor. Nowadays, these kanok are used in a Western style. So they're, they're actually saying, okay, this is the bedroom, this is the living room, and they heat it, and this is another bedroom, so that's all changed, changing now bit by bit. No complaint about it, but I just wanted to point out the development. Just to show you here, no comments for the peanut gallery. Yeah, it's my house. <laughs> I was preparing this lecture at night, and I said, God, I don't have enough pictures of a Hanukkah bar, and I'm going to find it. And one of the kids said, where are you living? <laughs> <laughs> Camera. <laughs> so like a dummy, I'm making photograph. Anyway, if you look, there's a refrigerator and a cooker, and you can see the floor is lower. Above it, these are the attic doors. These little doors are for shoes and the like. Two doors below you can't see. Little tiny doors that open to let the smoke, which used to be from the cooking places at this end, to come out. And this room here is the master room that I just showed you. So that's, forget about the television. It's a new Sony, uh, a new uh, Samsung. By the way. <laughs> but what I point out here is how exquisite. These are all original doors here. The house is, what, late 1930s. But they're really exquisite design. And the design of the doors, I'll explain later, is, is, is a very special thing. And if you see, there's a kid down there at a much lower level. I'm standing on the level floor of the, of the Anfang, and he's standing below. This little opening is to pass the popsang, the little table that you put on the floor, to sit on the floor and eat, pass it through the opening to the master and his wife. Or the wife passes it to the master, more to the point. Mm -hmm. yes. Right, so to summarize, raised stone platform to prevent humidity and get air to flow, position design driven by site, climate, purpose of building, and aesthetics, clay in roof, walls, and the floor for insulation, charcoal sub-base controls moisture, ondol is a heat retention system that I'll describe more detail in a moment, and salt in the vertical uh, pillars present, uh, prevents rot of insects. So essentially, there's a lot of science. I could lecture on that alone for an hour. Ondo means literally hot stone. <clears throat> no other culture in the world has applied the hot stone heat retention concept to the entire floor, wall to wall. People will say, ah, oh, no, in Rome, or blah, blah. There was a bath that had, okay, a bath. <laughs> All the living, sleeping rooms in the traditional Korean house had wall-to-wall -wall heating. There's no other culture that has that, that I can find. If you find one, let me know, because I want to know about it. <laughs> Real briefly, this is where you put the fire. The fire comes through, ash drops. As you can see, it's very broad because it's very hot, and there are two levels of stone because it's so hot, and then it narrows to speed up the fire and pass, and then it drops a little. And this design has been around for over a thousand years, this general design, and is continuously being refined. When this, above it, these are individual flues. That design seen from the top looks like this, so it comes in and fans out across the entire floor and joins together and goes up a chimney at the end. So what we're talking about is a huge mass of this clay and stone mixed in with the clay below, and then huge flat flagstones on top, and then more clay on top. So what happens when you light the fire? It simply is absorbed into this mass of clay and stone. One firing with five or six pieces of wood this big, the whole floor stays hot for 25 to 35 hours, depending upon how much you put in and the temperature outside. 
Compare that to a western wall fireplace. The fire goes out, you're cold. Moreover, if you stand in front of the fire, you're hot in the front and cold in the back, unless you have central heating, uh, and the other way around as well. Yeah, just to show convections, fire comes up, it circles around and around, and convex and convex, and then goes up. When the smoke goes up the chimney, whatever comes out the top is what you call cold smoke, because almost all the heat has been absorbed. I just showed you this. And there are all kinds of different designs of the flues, depending upon where the fireplace and the chimney are located. So we're really talking about a very sophisticated control of heat flow and heat evenness. The objective is not to have one section that's blazing hot and the other that's semi-hot or cold. <coughs> and since they've had 2,000 years to do it, they've got it down pretty well. This shows the various heat. Um, obviously, the more red, the hotter. But the point is to keep it a reasonably even heat at the floor level itself. Yeah, these are two old friends of mine. <laughs> just, just when I first came to Korea, of course. But these are the flues, very small room. They're standing at the chimney end where it is. it drops down as I showed you. And these are the flagstones that you're starting to place them. So it gives you an idea of what it looks like. On top of the flagstones is put the clay and it's smoothed off just like you do cement today. It's dry and then you put a very heavy, heavy paper on it and the paper is either oiled or lacquered. And you'll see what I mean. This is a uh, firebox. <laughs> Photographed that thing last night at home. <laughs> it's in, in my house. It's a wreck, I know. Yeah. But the point is, look at, look at how far the distance is from the top of the firebox to the level of the floor. I mean, that's a huge mass of material. And it takes, if it's a cold floor and you light it, you don't get any heat for five hours or six hours. But once it's there, it just goes on. And if you cover it with a big blanket or a quilt, it's magic. It'll stay 40 hours hot from one fire. Oops, wrong thing. Just real quick, with monumental building, palace building, provincial government center building, on the ends are ondel rooms, heated floor rooms. In the middle is a wooden floored parquet room, which is usually used for big meetings and the like. But the ondel floor goes under everything to make sure that no moisture will affect this massive wooden floored parquet room in the middle. There have been found archaeological remains of this type of heating dating all the way back to the, uh, well, actually, BC, but the only photographs I could find were Pare at Kingdom from 692 to 968. Whoops, what happened there? Oh, I'm missing one. I don't know where he went. Oh, there it is, Pekche Dynasty. Uh, the year 18 to about 668. Again, you can see Firebox was here, and it fanned out. Yeah, it's a long time ago, so it's a more primitive design, but these are remains of it. So this has been around a heck of a long time. Aesthetics in, in design. In Japan and in Korea both, but especially in Japan, they talk a lot about the building being in harmony with the nature around it. Yes, that's true. But there's another aspect of the Korean buildings that there has to be size, dimensional, proportional harmony among the members of the building as an entity unto itself before you get to the, the other harmonies. There is fine art and artisan work, philosophy, literature, and poetry. Here's a gorgeous building built in the year 1800. It's in Suwon, called Hwaryangjong, and it is a portrait hall for King Yongjo. The reason I photograph it is in incredibly original condition. If you notice a very delicate curve in the roof, and it's called Yongmaru, and then Nedilmaru Iljung Ijung. So you have one dimension, and the curve is the second. Third, and the curve, four, four, uh, three, four, five, six, and these count the same, actually. There is a curve from top to bottom here, and left to right, so the roof is essentially convex. There is a very delicate curve right to left at the end, and in Japan and in China, normally it curves a little on the ends and goes straight across. In Korea, the pattern normally 
was a continuous curve from end to end. But all of these dimensions must be in aesthetic proportion. There must be no curve or length of any piece of the roof that is disturbingly too long, too ugly short in comparison with the other dimensions around it. And it's purely aesthetic. Purely aesthetic. Ah, uh, this is gorgeous. I'm sorry, I'm emotional about building. <laughs> My friends, for you who speak Korean, call me the Hanoktorai. <laughs> I take that as a compliment, actually. This is gorgeous. This was built in the 17th century. It's in North Korea, of all places. And it's one of the few buildings remaining from a provincial government center in the city of Hanhun. Um, have you been there, Mr. John? Okay. And this... I'm just pointing out again, this building has a total different feel to it. It is presenting a magnificent to impress you feel. It has grandeur. It has weight. And I don't mean physical, I mean in terms of a person's dignity, weight, dignity representing the royal authority. I mean, it is truly magnificent with beautiful proportional roof lines, reasonably well maintained, and below them, as with the other buildings, you have these bays going across. So as with this one, there is no, so, sorry, first of all I follow the dynamically proportional roof, where everything is in balance, and under it there is a dynamically proportioned wooden structure, starting indeed from the stonework from the, from the courtyard to the top of the terrace, terrace to first wood on top of the beams, and then <coughs> from the bottom of the pillar to the first horizontal beam, left to right, up, down, and depth. So, cha u ki pi no pi, kyu yuk pi All of the proportional design must be in perfect harmony. In Japan, they actually developed formulas for this. That X has to be Y minus 2 plus this plus whatever. In Korea, it's sort of sitting and saying, oh, what do you think? Should we go a little higher on the right? And I, you, you should kind of go <laughs> No, no, no. Low on the left. Four workers are up there with the rack. Oh, make up their minds. And I actually witnessed that. I had the privilege to witness that back in the 60s one time. And there, it's purely aesthetic. Uh, but look at this building. Perfect proportions. If this were higher, it would look skinny tall. If they were wider, it would look too fat. And the same on this gorgeous building. Everything is in perfect proportion. This colonnade around the side. As you notice, this is a little bit narrower than the others because it's a colonnade. When you see doors like this with, with plaster and uh, solid walls, it's a heated floor room. When you see four doors within a bay, it's a wooden floored room, non-heated. But uh, again, the aesthetics are astounding. This is a, another administrative government building. By the way, the, the um, generic name of the provincial compounds was called Quan A. The Chinese called it Yamen, or Amun. But um, in the, the main biggest building, was something called Keksa Guest House. The administrative buildings were called Dong Han because they were to the east dong of the main building, Keksa. And you could have two or three Dong Han, Ne Dong Han, Wei Dong Han, Jung Dong Han, that kind of thing. But again, this is magnificent. This is in Chungchangdo, Chungju. And again, I mean, it's really dramatic on the roof on this one. But that's the styling. That was, that was desired. And this section raised here was used only in the summer and it's kind of pavilion style here. But this building has been recently restored. This is just a common farmer's house, a farmer who's reasonably done well, but it's still got a nice style. The roof is screwed up, I'm sorry to say. It's been recently restored and totally messed up. This is gorgeous. This is a pavilion on Sungyojang Estate where I lived. It was built in 1816. As one of, is one of the most architecturally pleasing buildings of pavilions aristocratic style. Again, if this compared with this, if this were a little longer, it would be too long. If the roof were shorter, it would be 
everything is in proportion. It's distance from the water to the top, and when the that's me in 1969, by the way. And I was doing repairs on it. It was a wreck. But the roof lines are still there. Just real quickly, here's a new panel. And it's nice to know that some people still understand because it's really quite well done. Look, you can see how the rainwater falls on the outside. You can see a very nice, pleasing design. They have the concavity of, of the main roof correct, and here as well. Very beautiful design. So you have a dynamic roof. I think it may be a little high for its its width here, but it's it's reasonable. It's reasonable. Note here that you have these placards with Chinese characters on them. This is usually philosophy or literary reference or uh, poetic references. Asked, uh, selected by the owner. The calligraphy is done on a piece of paper and it's taken to a very high skilled artisan, I would say artist, who reproduces that calligraphy precisely carving in the wood. And then usually paints the calligraphy deep cobalt blue or black and then the rest is white and it's put on the building and it becomes part of the building. Those are made for the building by either the owner or friends of the owner colleagues, scholars of the owner. Where is this? Sorry? Where is this? I don't know. I don't know. I got it off uh, somebody. Just making it up. Sorry? <laughs> Just making it up and nobody will know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know this. <laughs> yeah. Kongju. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, move quickly to interiors. Again, here we have the, the uh, wooden placard with calligraphy. Calligraphy itself is a fine art form, as you probably know. So you have fine art and artisan for the carving on it. You have philosophy, literature on it, which, may I say, is usually selected by the owner to be in harmony with the intent, the environment that he wishes for his, his house. So the house is built with a certain style, width, breadth, a placement with the nature that he wants, and also the purpose of the building, whether it's residence only, commercial only, com combining the two, whatever. So all of this is woven, philosophy, literature, utilization. Please note with the wood that you can't really see it too well, but on each corner of this kind of big beam and pillar, there is a uh, kumi, uh, a groove that is using one groove on external wood and two on the inside. It is called one moon, two grooves. Yi Jung Panda. Two grooves, half moon on the inside. If you look here, you can see this big main cross beam is heavily carved smooth. If that were just a square, beam in the middle. It would be very visually, aesthetically obtrusive to your eye. The same here. Here you have a narrow cross beam on the door frame and above it a very big heavy beam with extremely smooth curving to carry the aesthetics from a heavy to a light piece. It would look obtrusive and probably overbearing on the, on the small piece below it. The point is that when you stand or sit in the building looking out, your breadth of vision, right, left, above, below, looking either way should not be disturbed. Your eye should be able to flow down and everything is smooth with no obtrusions aesthetically. Oh, the sharp corner. Oh, God, that's really ugly. It has no beautiful redeeming features. So on this corner here of the door sill, there would be one, two, or even three grooves and maybe a half moon just to make the transition at the end of the door sill have some pleasure, uh, some pleasant aspects. The finishing on the wood, and this is a very old building, so the finishing is, is gone, but should be silk smooth. And the wood is either left alone or, or um, oiled. 
This is Songyo Dang Estate. This building was built in 1703. And uh, again, you can see the heavy cur uh, curving grooves on the sides. Guess what this is for? This is obviously where you step up. How many times have you had to take your shoes off, stepping up, and end up grabbing something to hold on to? That's what it's for. To hold on to keep your balance while you take your shoes off and walk up the stairs at the same time. Bloody good idea, really. Yeah. Okay, here's the inside of another building, actually. This is in Andong. And uh, again, we have the same thing. The, the transitions down from heavy beams to light ones. The very beautiful polished floor. This is a well-known photograph, but one of the few of an interior, 1890s interior of a Korean home. Almost none exist. Why do I point it out? Everywhere you look is art. We have, of course, the beautiful screen in the background. We have the silk uh, long cushion that usually has embroidery on it. We have the uh, flower vase and under it a wooden stand. The gentlemen are doubtless sitting on nice uh, pieces of, uh, of, um, of cushions. Sorry. And now I'll talk about the doors. The sliding doors throughout the house, the sliding doors design, is the development of a Chinese character. Maybe Po for, for good luck or fortune, or De Cha for reviving yourself. Some atmospheric mood that the owner wants that will be in harmony with the outside calligraphy and poetry on the placards that I mentioned. So he takes the Chinese character and he goes to the artisan who makes these doors and he says, I want Acha Mun in this part of the house. But in that part of the house, I want De Cha Mun. And that behind there, I want Pok Cha Mun, whatever. So that is, it's all very thoughty, <laughs> very philosophically, literarily thoughty. Whoops, God, don't want to miss the girls here. Here are the girls, I think they're geesing, but that's okay. <laughs> and they are, again, art everywhere. Everywhere. Beautiful screens. Some of the girls aren't bad either, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and they're practicing kukul, they're drawing orchids. And that was one of the most important aspects I'm mentioning here. Sorry. Flanking each of the sliding doors, there should be panels fixed to the wall, which are called kapchangmun, upon which are works of art or calligraphy. So in the ondo room, I'm talking about the ondo rooms, the heated floor rooms. <coughs> These were absolutely essential. On the right, this is a cha mun, and there we have two panels behind which the lattice work doors are opened. This is Naksonje, the dower house in Changdok Palace, but gorgeous treatment of doors. In this lotus pavilion, which I just showed you, inside. This is when I lived there, it looked like this. These are the panels beside the sliding, the sliding doors. These are the four gentlemen of nature. Meran Kuchuk. Whoops. I think they're mixed up. It doesn't matter. Me Plum Blossom Nan Orchid Kuk. Chrysanthemum Chuk Bamboo. And these very delicate frames. And they're put on by, by a matting process, which is really, a, again, a very high artisan skill that's used for making folding screens or hanging scrolls. Just to show you very quickly here, just some more examples within this house. Extremely refined and delicate. At the bottom of each of these different design for each one, by the way, circular, uh, six-sided, is a poem about the four gentlemen of nature. Each one is a different poem developing around the room. So we have fine art, we have calligraphy, we have poetry, we have pyobu, artisan, all blended with the building and all in harmony with its name, Hwanjejang, the coming of revitalizing of your spirit and life. Sweet, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And calligraphy, of course, on, on another large door. Inside the wooden floor of a pavilion building, it is festooned 
with important calligraphy. This is Chung Ha Wei Gong. Am I right? Thank you. This is my humble advisor here. Yes. And Kim Gu wrote this, the famous freedom fighter who ran against his Singman Ri. When he sneaked into Korea in the 1930s, he would come to Sun Gyutang, this estate, and be hidden there by, by his family. And he wrote this Chong Ha Wei Gong in this building for this building, and that was the very tradition. And each of these styles are different and exquisite calligraphy. This is a long um, philosophical description of the nature around Palaejong Pavilion and how it sits beautifully and floats upon the beauty of nature with the mountains suspending it in the background. All very, and this is the Marubang with the end framing nature. And that's really the quintessence of these pleasure pavilions. Right. Whoops. Sorry. Right. So 20th century, we get into the same thing, but this is the 20th century Hano. They glassed in kind of Japanese style the outside, but still retaining this kapchan, the beautiful glistening lacquered ondo heated floor, the doors to the attic. The same here. This is my house, but these are the doors up to the attic with the, with the calligraphy on them. And this is the ondo room. Um, again with the doors, the lattice work, but this is the quintessence of the traditional Korean um, aesthetic of interiors. So kitchen is sunken, maru, the wooden floor room, wood, wood selection and grain selection have to be perfect. The grains must be all the same size and type proportional dimensional balance, finishing, surfaces, quality grooving, unfound doors for the attic with painting, calligraphy, all under rooms, all had top channel panels with beautiful artworks of fine art on them, lattice work doors with themes of Chinese characters, and the vista viewing through wherever possible, especially in pavilions. That's the same thing in Korean, sorry. Let's move swiftly on here to monumental architecture. What the reason I did this long and boring lecture just now is that these same aspects apply to all this monumental architecture, but obviously ratcheting up the quality of it and sophistication. Reviewing very briefly, monumental architecture is in the following categories. Royal properties and government administration compounds in Seoul, palaces, and in the countryside, the provincial government centers, the county seat, the, the provincial center, and all that, which were divided into categories then called Bu, Mok, Gun, Hyun, Bi. Now it's Do, Gun, Up, Bi, Myun, that kind of thing. So some are the same, and some are changed. Another category is educational. In Seoul, the Sungyungwan University, with Confucian Shrine, and in the provinces, Hyanggyo and Sowon, again, each one always had a Confucian Memorial Hall. What people ignore completely is the military fortresses, military bases they were, in the countryside. As I mentioned before, they're just quick, sorry, I almost forgot. Um, official king's residence and uh, other throne halls, there were five in Seoul, in, in uh, 1910. Annex palaces, no throne, uh, Pyeolgung 12 to 15, depending how you count them, and we'll show you the rest <coughs> of country palaces later. There were 350 provincial centers in the countryside. Military fortresses, the concept militarily was that you had fortresses, military bases in the hills and the mountains, always to have a military advantage and look at. In each of these compounds, as with the Kwana, there were anywhere from 20 to 60, 70, 80 in some cases, buildings. So do the math. How many buildings are we talking about here? We're talking about thousands of buildings. We're talking about 13, 14, 15,000 buildings across this, across royal properties and military, not including the educational side of it. Nobody knows exactly because it's all gone. Just quickly, to let, 
Yeah. Ten minutes. Hmm? Ten minutes left. <laughs> I'll talk real fast. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just real quick here. 90% of all palaces in Seoul, the five palaces, were demolished. 95% of all, uh, this is during the Japanese period, 95% of the Pyeonggung were demolished starting the 1960s. The Japanese didn't touch those. This was all after the Korean War. All but two buildings of one Hengung, this is country palace, were destroyed during the 1910 to 45 period, and 99% of all country palaces were destroyed. So let's, again, numbers of buildings as I just said, palaces 800 to 1,000, provincial centers 8,500, military 3,000 to 5,000. Come on, let's go. Oh, it doesn't want to move. Oh. Here you go. Okay. okay. In Seoul, as you probably know, here's Kyungbok Palace, Duksu Palace, Changdok Palace, Chongyo Ancestral Shrines, Changyeong Palace, and Kyungi Palace. This is a map from the late 1920s, and I'm showing it because here's Kyungbok Palace with everything demolished, and these are the detached palaces over in the in the Insadong area and Angukdong area. And this is something called the Gumiyong. This is Kyungbok Palace as it existed before demolitions, and you can see it is a mass of buildings. Here's Kyungbok, and the buildings in front of it are the government, central government centers. These are the central government buildings. And of course, all of this 100% was demolished. Kwangmun Gate, as it originally stood, was demolished in 1926. And these are, as I said, palace and government centers leading up to where the Kyobo building is, the Kwanoman intersection. And this is what these ministry buildings look like between what is Kyobo building now, and this is the scale of them. So we're talking palace scale. This is the Ministry of War, and doesn't it look like it? This is power. Yes. Fear me. On the east wall of Kyobo Palace, oops, sorry. East wall of Kyobo Palace was the stream with stone bridges, stone retaining walls, and it was paved with stone as well. This is just generally, you've seen all this kind of thing, I'm just reminding you of the scale of the palace buildings that we're talking about. This is the site of Chungwade, by the way. These were the, the gardens behind Kempo Palace, and then the Japanese came and demolished it all. Changdokgung. You think that it has a lot of buildings, don't you? I'm sorry, there are only 5% of the buildings remaining that were there originally. Look at this. This is a well-known screen. Changdok Palace, these are photographs from the 1890s. Just to show you what the Japanese did, this was the throne hall. Under Sunjong, they took out his great symbols of authority, the sun, the moon, the proper cinnabar throne, and replaced it with two peacocks and a kind of semi-Louis XIV funny chair, etc., etc., all to denigrate. In the palaces, it was becoming Europeanized with curtains and electricity, and even the decor inside was becoming Europeanized, pot-bellied stoves, <laughs> along with the electricity. Uh, Louis XIV again appears in the royal chambers. You can all see this today. Just to remind you of the scales, and again, the framings of nature from pavilion buildings that you saw a moment ago. Just to remind you, and again, the, the, uh, the philosophy and everything in the royal buildings, obviously a scale higher than what I previously showed you. Gardens were always terrace gardens. And all of this existed in also, uh, sorry, Duxu Palace. This is a European building in which King Kojong was intimidated by the Japanese with weaponry to sign the annexation documents in 1910. And here are lovely palace ladies walking down the stone steps of Sakchojang in Duxu Palace about 1902. Yeah. This palace was totally demolished, Kyungi Palace, which is where the Seoul Museum of History is. They were moved to Tongbuk University. The palace was rebuilt anew. That's what the Japanese put on the site a school for Japanese children, and a gymnasium for the little Japanese boys 
to walk up and down over the steps to the throne of the king, which only the king should walk on to denigrate and destroy his dignity. Just to drive the knife a little deeper and twist it as much as we can, here's the destruction of Kyungi Palace, the main gate, Hung Hwa Mun, in the 1920s. Oh, that's wrong. And just one quick example of villas. The royal family had so many villas, I can't count them. But they were placed in beautiful settings in mountains and hills surrounding Seoul. This is Sokpa Jan. Sokpa is the pen name of the Taewon Gun, the region for King Kojong. And these I took 30 years ago. And it still has its kind of Japanese esque. But you know, it's lovely amidst the uh, pine trees. It's now been restored to originality, but beautiful little nooks and crannies with lovely roofs. And this is the kind of thing you see in a scroll painting. Beautiful pavilions with the forest behind it. This is one of, this is, used to be a detached palace, Pungbun Girls School, Angukdong Rotary, where you go into <coughs> Insadong from Angukdong. And it was a significant detached palace. Queen Yun was married to King Sun Jong in this palace and decreed that it should be used as a girls' school. In the original palace building, she died in 66, and they immediately demolished all the buildings that she had decreed should never be demolished. And now there's nothing left. These are the buildings, the scale of them that you can see. So these Kelbu, detached palaces which have no throne, there were, I don't know, 15, 18 of them in 1945. There's one left, which is Unyang Palace. And they were for what I call the loser prince, the one who didn't get to be king. Um, and they, this is Sadongbung, which was the home of the fifth son of King Kojong, and the last building of Sadongbung, which was in uh, Kwanundong, which is part of Insadong, was demolished in 2006. Here's a photograph of that demolition. Isn't it lovely how they destroy a several hundred year old detached palace? Sun Yen Wood, as I said, built 1479, and that original building was demolished right to the ground with all the stoneworks in, 16, uh, in 1962. All of these little gates were destroyed during the Japanese period. This is East Gate. Over here is Independence Gate. And this is the Kyungi <coughs> Provincial Government Center, which is now Dochong in Suwon. But this was a compound. These are the main buildings of it, just to give you an idea. And so this is essentially a kwana. The um, normal kwana that I told you before, Hyangwoku, this kind of thing, were the normal centers. The docheng was called kamyong, the, uh, the head. Tengo, detached palaces in the countryside. There were 14, 15 of them. There are nine shown here. Here, oops. Sorry. Yeah. Here's Kyungwo Palace. There were several purposes. Some of them were used for the king and the court to escape. No, I can't find it. I can't find it. For the king and the court to escape in time of war. So they would put a hengum detached palace inside a military fortress. For example, in Naman Sansom. Here are just a list of them. You don't have to look at them, but just show you how many <coughs> there were. I'm trying to create in your mind an understanding of the massive extent of significant architecture with art and culture involved. This is Kwangju Fortress, Naman Sansong, South Fortress, and this is the detached palace. There was also a government center, a kwana, inside it. This is the governor, and it says here, Naman, yep, okay. And this is the palace. The last part of this palace three buildings, four buildings, was destroyed in 1976. It's now been rebuilt at great expense, but it's incredible that they would destroy something like this in 1976, but that's what was going on. Here's one in Pugansan, Sansong, destroyed in the 20s. These are the royal baths, hot springs, in Onyan, where the king went to take the waters. Sound familiar in Britain to those of you who are from that country? There's nothing left. Suwon Hengong is the only significant one that is in existence, but only two buildings, original buildings, remain. No original buildings remain from any other Hengong in the country. This is a massive palace. 
that was demolished in the 19, late 20s and early 30s. Two buildings remained. It's now been rebuilt. If you ever have a chance to go, you can go with us. I need a tour to Sue one in the springtime. Yes, it's part of my advertisement for it. But the uh, court moved here in the summertime. And it's a significant place. Exceptionally beautiful. And beautiful city walls of great significance. And they're all still there. So to summarize demolitions on this scale, just look at the percentages across the palaces. 97, 98%, etc. Just to show you, Kemble Palace before demolitions, look at the number of buildings. It was more than 300 buildings. In 1945, there were 12. And nobody knows what happens to the furnishings and the paintings and screens and scrolls and jewelry, all the valuables in a palace with 300 buildings. And the Japanese say, oh, no, we didn't take them. When we went into the palace, it was empty. I'm sorry. The palace was fully operational in 1896 when Kim <coughs> was assassinated and the Japanese were occupying one half and the Korean the other half. She's murdered and the Japanese occupied the entire thing. King Kojong escaped several months later and the Japanese say, when we walked in, it was all really empty. There's something funny going on there. Demolitions after 1954, all Kyogun, all detached palaces in Seoul except the Nyung Palace. South Gate, all stone bridges and walls, especially Cheonggyecheon, were demolished. The altar of the royal household was demolished. And several hundred thousand Hanok individual residences have been demolished. Here is a similar to Pyeongbong, Kamgodan, that was disassembled and moved to Yeoju. Beautiful building built in 1667 and destroyed in 1965. This is the office of the royal household. Dis dismantled in 1984, moved to another area, lose 30% of the structure when you do that. Then it was a few months ago demolished again and moved back to its original site. If there are 20% of the original beings, I'm happy. Chung Ye Chun, we're so proud, and the city government has received an award for this restoration of Cheonggyecheon. And yeah, it was terrible. It was covered over with concrete, <laughs> with an elevated highway above the stream. But what was there before that concrete was built? There were 12 bridges between Kwanamun Intersection and Tongbyeon Gate. 12 stone bridges that had been there since the 1400s. The walls of the bridge, of the, sorry, of the stream were cut granite. This is King Kojong passing over Kwangyo, the largest bridge. And yes, it's a mess in these photographs because it wasn't being maintained, hadn't been maintained for years. Of course, anything you don't maintain for 80, 90 years looks like hell and is falling apart. <coughs> when they took up the concrete under uh, uh, Im Young Bak as mayor, they found under there a lot remaining. These are the original pillars. And please note that the floor of the entire street was paved with big wide stones. And every two or three years, I'm sorry, this is the one remaining bridge that was moved carefully to near the Shilla Hotel. And you can see the beautiful styling of this. Any other city in Europe, for example, has postcards. This is a major tourist and cultural attraction, something that their heritage are proud of. And here, you tear it up and throw it on the trash and cover it with cement. I'm so sorry. This is the Supyoko's original site, right up until it was demolished in 1970. And here's the one at the end next to Tongdaemun East Gate that carried the city wall over Cheonggyecheon Stream. This is bad, you can hardly see it, but this is that same bridge, and this is a Ministry of Civil Works official report to King Yeongjo. This is taken from that official report. And they're showing King Yeongjo sitting on the bridge, observing the carrying out of his orders for uh, cleaning, for taking all the silt out and fixing anything that's wrong. And you can see on the right and left is a little park with pavilions. These are the edges of East Gate. These bridges had tremendous, there was a custom 
on the first full moon after Lunar New Year, Te Huru, to cross over the stone bridges. And the, the uh, belief was that if you crossed over the bridge under the full moon of Te Huru, you became one year younger. Well, let me tell you, everyone was out there doing that. <laughs> And yet that heritage can be just tossed right out, along with the architectural and everything else. So now what do we have? We have the Grand Canyon in the middle of Seoul. It's double the depth and more than double the width, and everything has been demolished. To the east, we had this, I showed you this before, Tremble Palace, East Wall, Stream, Bridges, Retaining Wall. And in 1962, uh, 60, yeah, 62, this is another photograph of it. Golly, isn't that a wonderful improvement, get rid of those nasty 500 year old bridges and stonework and we've got a LA California looking street. <laughs> and right, so, just really quick, provincial centers, let me just show you. This is something that I'm sure you're unaware of. 350 walled town cities, villages. Look at the massive scale of this, this town wall around. And then the internal wall surrounding this government center. And they're only showing the most important buildings. They don't show everything here. These were mini palaces of the same scale and size and magnificent sophistication as the royal palaces in Seoul that I just showed you. 350. Minimum 20 buildings up to 80 buildings times 350 do the math. This remains in North Korea. They've restored this section of the wall, this pavilion remained. It was in rough shape. It, had, it has been repaired. This is in Chungcheongdo, Hongju, and they've restored the wall, and they restored the little park. This old tree was remaining, and the foundations of the pavilion remained. They've restored it. Chejudo has restored their Kwana Center. This is an administrative building, a very minimal one, because it's only Cheju, but there was an obligatory lotus pond. The official residence of the governor of each of these centers would have a little garden behind, like I showed you a few moments ago in the palaces, but smaller scale. But the scale of the buildings is palatial. Sorry. Oh dear. This is Kangnun, East Coast. And this is the original Kwana taken, I don't know, maybe 19s, and it had not yet been demolished. This is too bad, you can't see it very well, but this is the big uh, uh, Keksa building and I'll show you what they did to it in a moment here. This gate still exists, and it was built in the Koryo dynasty. Each of these 350, not all of them, most of the 350 centers date back to the Three Kingdoms period, Shila Pekche Koguryo. On that same site, there has been an administrative building with sophisticated centers for over a thousand, two, three, four hundred years. And when the Japanese demolished everything, Here's Sunchan. Sunchan, Chalanando, Keksa, as you can see, Donghun, and the bridge, water flowing in front, as I pointed out before, a man made lake with pavilions on it, extremely sophisticated. And these photographs are from Dr. John Linton, who uh, had them from his grandfather, who took them in 1911. In, and you can see there's the bridge, the river, and the gate. And there's the city wall. The Japanese have been demolishing it. They've demolished a third of the Keksa building, and it's about to go. Naju, this, these are drawings from the Kyujanga, the Royal Archives. Uh, so you have Kyungijun here, and the government center here. And this one building in the middle remained, just this little bit here. They've done excavations. And around the country, there's a wonderful revival for local regional pride to try to find the remains of their monumental Keksa uh, Kwana provincial centers. So they've redone the painting. They have to redo the walls inside. This is Chinju, and it had a beautiful Keksa, which is out here. And this is what the Japanese do to these magnificent buildings. They knock off all the walls, all the floors. They put in a full ceiling, and they put beautiful little jetty sliding glass windows and turn it into a primary school. <coughs> Not all of them, most of them they just demolished outright. This is North Korea, Hamhun, Northeast Coast. This is the main Keksa. <coughs> We're talking 60 buildings roughly within this thing. Magnificent, 
palace and look at the, the stoneworks around it. This is a magnificent uh, city wall fortress type. This is the main gate to it with the great bell tower on the left, just like in Seoul. Every one of these had a south gate, a north gate, an east gate, a west gate with a bell tower to ring to close the doors. And here's that beautiful building I showed you before, the administrative building of the Hamhung Kwana Provincial Center. This is the only photograph that exists anywhere of an interior. So the dais where the governor would sit would be here, raised on his dais, this is where they have big meetings and banquets, heated floor rooms on either side for the coldest weather. Just to give you an impression, all the local government centers were here. You had land titles, you had family records, all day what you would do in any normal place. And this is what it looked like. This is this is Ulsan. Enormous. Let's not do that. Okay. Kochang, this has been recently uh, about eight years ago restored. This is where the governor sits and then you have heated floor rooms and then more external sitting areas. But this is the main magnificent building plus 30, 40 buildings on top. Same with this Kangwando Young World, just to show you examples. Very small one. <coughs> we already saw this administrative, very tiny one. But there's almost nothing left. These are all in North Korea. Why there are so many photographs? And you get a vision of the style and size. This is right on the border with Manchuria. Look at the ferocious size and extent of the walls. You can barely see the Keksai inside these very old photographs. And they were allowed to fall into disrepair. This is the one in Kongju being demolished by the Japanese. Beautiful pleasure pavilions sitting on the hills, all part of these places. So you had not just admin, not just meeting halls, but pleasure pavilions, lotus ponds, gardens, and the rest. And here are the Japanese military trashing one of these centers. Japanese military using one as a military base. Japanese military ripped out everything and using a building as a garage for artillery. More Japanese, more military. Isn't it charming what they do this? And they totally have trashed all the buildings and then they demolish them. They have a little Japanese portico for this. And this is the kind of building they put on the site to replace the traditional building. A semi-European style administrative building. <coughs> So chosen military compounds, same thing, there's almost nothing left. I showed you this before. <coughs> South Fortress, there's only one building I can find in the whole country, wooden building, of, a, of an army, chosen army um, uh, base, as you call it. Garrison. They were called Tansong in Korean, military garrison, that's the best word for it. Of course, the walls remain, often in very bad shape, but they're being restored one by one. But the wooden structures, we're talking thousands of buildings again here. The only two that are really significant are navy. One is in Yosu, called Jinnamua. This is built right not long after the Indian War of 1590s. Magnificent structure. All the walls are gone. It was turned into a primary school. But look at the scale and size of this building. This building and the other one, and this is what the Japanese did to it. Again, rip out all the floors, rip out all the walls, put in little Japanese sliding doors and turn it into a primary school. This is the one in Tongyong, Seiyongguan. And this has been more restoration here. Everyone in Tongyong try to see this, because the military base they restored about, I think, 15 buildings of it. But look at the, the, the diocese in the middle, they restored as much as they could. Yeah, we won't do that. Right. So... It's fine. Okay, I understand. We're almost there. <laughs> right across from the Changduk Palace Gate was a compound called the Gungyeong, which is a military officer's compound for coordination with the Royal Court. <coughs> and it stayed there till It was built in 1682 and was demolished in 1976. It was used here the Korean military period, pretty slowly looking brutal, but what are you going to do? And it was used briefly by the National Classical Music Institute, descendants of the Royal Court of Brazil. They were, they were ejected, the buildings demolished, and someone corporation built their headquarters on the site. 
I wonder if there was money involved. I can't imagine that. Yeah. This is some UW State where I lived, again, just to show you. Mr. John here had a house of this same style. Was it the same size or not? <laughs> anyway, he lived in a very, very fine aristocratic home in Wonju, Kanwondo. This escaped damage in the war. But the vast majority of the beautiful Chosen period residential homes, and especially the estates, <coughs> largely were demolished during the tragic Korean War. It was a terribly destructive. Mr. John's ancestral home was totally demolished. Really a tragedy. But if you look at the, scape, the scope and style, this is what it looks like today. Built in 1703, 1810, the Lotus Pond House, 1816, 1816, 1880s, etc., etc., etc. I mean, this is a magnificent estate. Yeah, guess who? I had hair at one time. Oh, okay. It's me. I know you don't believe it, but it's true. Look at this. It's gorgeous. And this is, I did the restoration myself as a very young fellow and got the uh, pond to be, uh, I dredged it out all by myself. This is what it looks like today. And that's me also, but showing the vista. Forget the guy. It's the vista you've got to look at. In the winter, in the summer, floating on a sea of lotus. Just real quick. This is the vista of Seoul that I'm saying, if you look at Europe and how much is preserved of their original cultural vista. In Korea, all gone. And I'm sorry to say, so much of it still remained when I came to Korea right through the 1970s. There were several hundred thousand Hanok in Seoul up to the end of the 1960s, very early 70s. Now there are less than 3,000, 4,000 left in Seoul. And the government planning still says we're going to demolish more. In spite of the catastrophic losses since 1910, demolitions continue today of traditional Korean architecture. 90% of the Hanok have been destroyed since the early 60s. Demolitions continue today and no effort. And we talk about Pukchon, the preservation area. What preservation? They demolished the original building and built a new one with green wood on the site that bears no resemblance to the styling of anything. Is there cultural value in that? And they received a award for this from UNESCO. Again, these are all new, brand new. Here's a perfect example of a very early 1920s, I believe, Hanok that was demolished to the ground and then a totally new one built with all green wood. Now, I'm happy that there are some Hanok still around. Another one, totally newly built, inside, outside, and the rest. And it's fine to put creature comforts. It's important to have heating, good bathroom, good kitchen, blah, 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 but not at the expense of the rest of the structure. Here are some original Hanok. All of these houses I'm showing you here are in un, under threat by the city government for, for mandatory demolition. These are all original. Rare, beautiful, traditional Hano. In Sungmukdong, that's my house in Tong Sungmukdong. I'm also under threat. This is another house right in my neighborhood. Beautifully original. All his, his philosophy and poetry <coughs> remain. This is in Pumundong. Hey, they turned the Hanuk into a 7-Eleven. Fine. <laughs> Don't demolish the damn thing. <laughs> Here's a beautiful Hanuk. Two old people live in this. And the views, again, is the lower Sungguk Dome. <clears throat> Just to show you this atmosphere. And these are almost totally gone. There were hundreds of these two-story commercial buildings, Hanuk style, with the owner's house attached at the back. And they're all but gone. There's just a tiny handful remaining. The re government's redevelopment projects still remain. This says exactly that. This is the Seoul City Government's uh, City Development Plan, promulgated in 2004, and it designates each of these areas in Sungbuk Ku and every other Ku in the city 
and in this case I, I copied this one because each of these areas is a Hanok area. They're targeted right up to today. And the government says, oh no, we're doing preservation. The only preservation is oh, uh, sorry, um, uh, procedure is Qigong, a zoned area. And everything out of the zone not only can be demolished, but will be demolished forcibly by this policy. These are Hanuk in 2006 that at that time were subject to demolition. They're all gone. All of these 1960s, this is all Hanuk around Chongmyo, Pagoda Park, all Hanuk, Chongnogu, Chebudong, Anandong, and this is what we're talking about, and there's a growing opposition. Look at these violently worded anti jk signs. It's changing, but it's almost too late. And for those of you who know Kim Chu Jan, Nuk Ki Jan Ae, something better be done, because it's almost <laughs> too late. And these are all anti. And the tragedy of Yongdudong, this beautiful Hanok neighborhood, solid Hanok, with the most, and then suddenly jk Everything's torn down. The only Hanok is a demolished Hanok. And what's left? Nada. It's all gone. Why is this? Lack of awareness. People are not aware. The educational system, the societal structure does not teach. People have a general prejudice that buildings are worthless. When the building's lifespan reaches 20 years, it is called by law for tax reasons, no hu puyang kanchuk mul. It's a useless building whose lifespan is finished. They're inconvenient and uncomfortable, and it's hopeless. There's no way to make them comfortable. So the only answer is to destroy it and build a new one. And that's 99% of the people come at me with that. And of course, because of the 20 year nonsense, after 20 years, if you sell your property, you get no money for the building. You only get money for the land. It doesn't matter what it is. So, do you maintain it during that time? No. So, therefore, it makes a reality of the, of the, uh, um, of the prejudice. So, what are we ending up with now? Government prioritizations, policies, procedures. They don't respect authenticity. Authenticity, if they do maintain it, the original design features are not maintained. New policies and procedures are needed to stop all this redevelopment policy nonsense for Hanuk neighborhoods. Effective programs for all Hanuk, not just designated. Proactive education for owners and municipal government people on ballot views and how it, they can be maintained. And a special support office in government offices, Hanuk Crisis Center for maintenance and repair to help owners out. So this is the last slide. It's almost too late. I've been fighting this for about 20 years now, and I hope that something can be done, and I hope you can appreciate the, uh, the importance of Korean architecture. Thank you. Uh, we will have uh, a session, prolonged session of questions and answers in Jacob's over beer. Uh, straight away. We can do one or two questions. We got four minutes. We got four minutes. We have to be out. Yes. Okay. Um, one or two. Yes. Um, regarding the under heating system, how and why was the wood floor, which was between the two uh, lacquer floors, locked off from heating? How did they do that? And why did they do that? If the under basically ran under that room as well. Uh, Why did they, they not want to heat it? They didn't want to try to heat. I, I got some here. They didn't want to try to heat the whole house with one because they wanted to be able to heat the room separately for fuel safety. Because they don't use all the rooms at one time, so each floor has its own firebox, and they're blocked off from one room to the next, of course, by a solid wall of the of the clay with stone <coughs> from the next room. Like the oh, that was, that's a monumental building. That's a palace or a, 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 a big uh, government center. But for the common homes, it's just one bundle for one room. Yeah, yeah. 
Any other questions? Yes. So, uh, the Royal Palaces today, which one is the most intact? Chandok Palace, probably. And the oldest buildings that remain are in Changyong Palace. There are actually a couple buildings that escaped the engine war in the 1590s. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.